I'm really starting to sense a theme here. Sierra even said, just take the first step and do it. So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take that as as a mantra and run with it. <laughs> so next up. Uh, I want to introduce Kyra Eskate, the CEO of America's Service Commissions. Kyra leads the National Association for the Network of 52 State and Territorial Service Commissions and is a close partner and a close friend of Service Your Alliance. Previously, Kyra served as the Executive Director of Reimagining Service and before, before that spent nearly 14 years at California Volunteers in a variety of roles, including Chief of Staff. I want to thank Kyra for her team's recent collaboration with Service Year Alliance and AmeriCorps on our toolkit, expanding service years in states and local communities, which if you haven't seen it, please check it out. You can find it in our expo resources. Um, it's available for all. We're really thrilled. Kyra has also lifted up our shared vision for universal national service with state service commissions and community partners. So we are thrilled to be working closely with Kyra and the team at ASK. And Kyra, you can take it from here. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that introduction and for your ongoing partnership um, with ASK as, and Service Year as we work to collectively expand national service and communities across the country. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today to discuss place-based national service strategies and the work of state service commissions in supporting such efforts. And I want to echo the thank yous um, that have gone out to the Mott Foundation um, for their investment in national service and, and helping to bring us together this week. I think this is a really important conversation conversation and so so delighted to be with everyone this week. Um, as Kristen mentioned, um, I serve as the CEO of America Service Commissions or ASK as you'll unlike, undoubtedly hear us mention it today. Um, and we are the National Association for State Service Commissions. Um, commissions advance national service and volunteerism strategies in 49 states the District of Columbia, as well as in two territories. Um, so that's how we get to our magic number of 52 um, state and territorial service commissions. Um, state service commissions play a central role in advancing national service. We're gonna go ahead and advance the slides to kind of show you a little bit more about the role of state service commissions. Um, so the primary responsibility for state service commissions is supporting AmeriCorps state and national programming in their respective states. And there's many, many, um, roles that they play in doing so, but there's really three that I want to focus on for our conversation today. Um, the first of those is program development. So commissions conduct outreach to potential applicants and provide assistance um, to those applicants in developing new AmeriCorps programming. And that's a really important role for commissions, and particularly as we've talked about expansion of national service in recent years, commissions have taken a, a leading role in really developing new programming across the country. Another critical role of commissions is training and technical assistance. So commissions provide extensive training and support to programs and helping them understand the requirements, um, as well as identifying and sharing best practices for them to take their work to that next level. And then finally, and maybe not the most fun part for anyone, but yet it's still a critically important one as well, is that commissions monitor programs to ensure compliance with the federal requirements, but also to identify opportunities for continuous improvement so that national service programs can grow and thrive in communities across the nation. So next slide, please. Um, so what I want to share with this group today as we lead into our panel is that fundamentally commissions are grant makers and they are interested in bringing national service resources to new communities in their states as well as assisting organizations determine what national resources or excuse me national service resources are really the best fit for them. Um, if you were able to join us yesterday, you heard a little bit about the role that the Michigan Commission has played in supporting efforts in Flint, and you're definitely going to hear more about that today. Um, as well, um, as Sonali, um, the Director of AmeriCorps State National, shared the role that California Volunteers has played in lifting up the Stockton Service Corps. Um, further, I think that another important role that commissions can play and do play throughout the country is that they are well positioned to develop partnerships with state agencies and public private partnerships with philanthropy. We see that increasingly around the country. Commissions are working with uh, their state agency partners to figure out how can we take national service and really have it be a tool to help that state agency 
um, achieve its mission, whatever that might be, whether that be with housing, whether that be with food insecurity, whether that be in the climate and environmental space. Again, those partnerships are definitely emerging. And in addition to that, um, with philanthropy and corporate funders as well, really, how are we developing those public private partnerships to really, again, extend this work into new communities um, and new issue areas and really address some of those issues around equity that Kristen um, mentioned earlier as well. So in going into the next slide, Kristen already mentioned this as well, but I just want to uh, reiterate um, our excitement over um, the new resource guide that we've been able to release in partnership um, with Service Year Alliance as well as the uh, Federal AmeriCorps Agency. This resource, and you see the, the cover page um, on the slides here, um, is an, again entitled Expanding Service Years in States and Local Communities. And it provides dozens of examples from all across the country of commissions working with state and local government partners, as well as philanthropic and business leaders to support national service. Um, and we actually put this guide together back in 2017 and we're really really excited about it then but so many exciting developments have happened over the course of the past four years we felt really compelled to reissue it um, and includes uh, many of those new examples so when you look at this resource you're going to see um, examples of new programming that was developed to respond to covid during the past 18 months you're also going to see um, new examples of environmental programming that's coming together to address climate change as well um, so if you haven't had a chance to check out this resource um, we definitely encourage you to do so. It is an, an excellent document, even if we say so ourselves, but I think one that will provide you with a lot of inspiration as you think about next steps following this week's convening. So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists for today's conversation. We have a great group of State Service Commission staff members that are really going to be able to dive deep into this conversation about the role that State Service Commissions play in really supporting place-based strategies. So first, um, I'm going to introduce Joy Alston. Um, Joy is a program officer with the Michigan Community Service Commission. And Joy previously worked as a program staff member in Flint and also served as an AmeriCorps member in Detroit. So she really has a lot of context both from the Flint perspective as well as the State Service Commission perspective to offer up today. Next up, we have Jacqueline Kolar. Um, Jacqueline serves as the Director of National Service at the One Star Foundation, which is the Texas State Service Commission. Um, in this role, Jacqueline oversees the Commission's portfolio of 38 AmeriCorps programs, as well as One Star's AmeriCorps VISTA project, which she's going to speak a little bit more about in a moment as well. Um, Jacqueline also has worked as a program staff member in Texas and is a two-time AmeriCorps alum. And finally, we have Brent Kosick. Brent is the Director of Advancement in AmeriCorps South Carolina, and like Joy and Jacqueline, is, is an AmeriCorps alum as well. Um, Brent has been engaged in national service programming for 13 years and wears a variety of hats for the commission, but is primarily responsible for spearheading new initiatives and supporting new applicants and grantees as they develop and stand up new projects. So super delighted to have these three state service commission staff members with us today and also so impressed that we have three alums as well. It's always exciting for me to see um, when we have state service commission staff that also serve as well. I think it gives them such a unique as we think about how do we fund these types of programs, how do we cultivate these types of programs as well. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, really pleased to have you with us here today. So I want to start out with a question for everyone on the panel um, to respond to because I think it'll be helpful for um, our attendees to really understand how your particular state commission approaches this work and what's been working well. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about your role in supporting community-based collaboratives in your respective states? Specifically, how do you work um, to support public-private partnerships for national service in your state? And from the state commission perspective, why is this type of partnership particularly compelling? Um, so actually, Jacqueline, can I ask you to go first in responding to that question today? Absolutely. Hi, Kyra. Everyone, thanks for having me. This is really exciting. Um, yeah, so One Star, we are, uh, I'll start with saying we are very fortunate in that we have amazing programs in our state. So any of this work really cannot happen without the programs um, being leaders in their own work and leaders in their communities. So I, I know that's probably every state will say this, but we really do have some really, really great programs um, happening in Texas. Uh, so One Star's perspective on supporting this, we love community place-based initiatives. We think that it opens the door for so many opportunities for AmeriCorps members to get to know multiple types of AmeriCorps programs, to tap into a larger network. Um, so we really appreciate it from that perspective. 
We also see just some general efficiencies when programs are working together, um, whether it's programs or um, you know other organizations in their community that are supportive of the work that's happening. Um, there's you know the shared resources and pooling resources to achieve a mission um, is always an efficient way to to get things done. So what we do um, specifically, or at least some specificity, is that we're supporting our programs. Um, with information. So Texas is obviously a very large state. Um, and so getting tapped into what programs are operating in, in El Paso, what programs are operating in Houston, and just making those connections at the beginning and make sure that everyone that is has AmeriCorps funds, whether that's AmeriCorps State or a AmeriCorps National Direct Grant or a VISTA project, knows who else is operating in their community is important. So we try to do annual regional collaboration lists that we share with programs to kind of connect and keep everyone um, in the know, I guess, about what's going on in their community. Um, and then we're also really fortunate that we have two impact communities. Um, so AmeriCorps Central Texas in the Austin area and then North Texas National Service Alliance, make sure I got that in the right order, um, up in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, have been impact communities for several years now um, through service year. And so those two communities have really kind of launched and exploded of what their collaborations can look like. Um, and this is everything from bringing all members together for Life After AmeriCorps training um, or partnering on um, a recognition day with mayors. Um, or in AmeriCorps Central Texas, they've really kind of stepped it up even further and gone after private philanthropy and, and increase funds for advancing their diversity, equity, and inclusion work um, or raising the living allowance for returning members. And I can talk a little bit more about those details in a little bit. But in general, we, we're just trying to connect the dots, keep everyone um, engaged and kind of know what's going on um, is, is one of our primary roles, I'd say. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Jacqueline, and giving that initial perspective on what's happening in Texas. So, Joy, can I ask you to talk a little bit more about what's happening in Michigan in this regard? Um, and obviously, you bring a really interesting perspective, being that you have worked in Flint and are now at the commission as well. Yeah, so I would echo a lot of what Jacqueline just shared about connecting the dots for our grantees. Um, we are looking kind of statewide at bringing people together. So of course we bring our programs and um, program directors together for training and technical assistance, but then we're also bringing together members from across the state. So we have a leader core initiative where we're able to really um, get some of the most committed and um, focused AmeriCorps members to come together and think about what that experience is like, and then take some of those ideas back to their communities, collaborate on service projects, um, collaborate on how to improve the member experience and really be a resource both for program staff and for the members as well. Um, and in other things, we're thinking through how do we create um, an advisory, National Service Advisory Council and Leadership Council where we can bring stakeholders, programs, and policymakers to the table to think about what are the challenges facing National Service and how can we best address those in each region. So I, I think we're definitely connecting the dots. We definitely want to make sure that when we're thinking about recruitment and impact that we're connecting um, all programs in the same region to each other to really collaborate on those things, especially in this time when um, recruitment and retention and all of those metrics can be a real challenge. So yeah, connecting the dots, I, I would echo that. Great, thanks, Joy. And Brent, what about in South Carolina? Sure. Thanks, Kyra, and great work, Jacqueline and Joy. Uh, but yeah, in South Carolina, we're a little bit unique where our state commission is actually housed within the United Way Association of South Carolina. And also we serve as the only state commission that's also a service year alliance impact community. So I'll talk about that a little bit later on down the road. Um, but in addition to being an alternative administrative agency for the state, we also have a strong connection to those 26 local uh, United Way networks throughout South Carolina. And so we believe the structure has served us fairly well where it's been, allowed our commission to be fairly nimble with uh, additional opportunities that come up either through uh, federal government or locally. Um, it also allows us um, to have that network with the local United Ways, it helps us connect to each individual community in our state. So um, usually those local United Ways already have strong connections with like business leaders or um, nonprofits or faith-based community or government officials. So they're really um, serve as a network to communicate the needs throughout the state to us so that we can kind of already know what's happening on 
uh, the local level so we can help support that out of our office. Um, we're also very uh, strongly connected to our state's 211 network, which for those of you all who aren't familiar with that, is an information referral line. So basically any kind of need someone might have, maybe they need childcare assistance, uh, they can call 211 and get connected to local providers that might be able to assist with that. And what that allows our commission to do is we really have real time data on what the needs are in the state and how those are evolving. Um, so for example, with COVID, we could see what communities were struggling the most with say rent assistance requests or uh, food assistance and things like that. So uh, there been some great benefits of kind of how we're structured here in South Carolina. So I could highlight a few different ways that we work on local collaboratives, but I wanted to kind of move forward with the local United Way network. So we actually have six local United Ways that serve as AmeriCorps grantees. And one of the biggest ways that we've used this is through funding them as what we call intermediaries. So we might give them a larger AmeriCorps grant, and then they can actually, because they already have these relationships in the communities, can subgrant those out to smaller nonprofits that maybe don't have the staff capacity to host, you know, 10, 20 AmeriCorps members themselves or work through all the different processes for that. Um, another way that this um, uh, relationship has been beneficial and really um, kind of spoke, spoke to the presentation by United Way of Genesee County yesterday was that United Ways are kind of known for their fundraising abilities. So these local United Ways can also fundraising for match support, uh, where those smaller nonprofits maybe still have a cost share for those AmeriCorps members, but maybe not a full like 50% or 25% type of thing. So that's a benefit as well. Uh, finally, with um, the, these intermediates, we also see that since there's a strong connection to the business and corporation um, entities in that, that area of the state, they're really connected to the members' professional development. So they'll provide members with training, uh, mock interviews, even like speed networking events. So that also helps them kind of with those pathways to uh, post-service opportunities. Uh, so before I pause, I do want to just also briefly mention that uh, our state commission, I think, also is kind of proud about how we use volunteer generation funding, which uh, unlike AmeriCorps, um, it's not tied to AmeriCorps positions. It's really uh, used to enhance um, organizations' abilities to recruit, retain, and administer volunteers. So we actually subgrant those funds out to local communities, and we kind of give funding priority to organizations that also use that funding and capacity building nature. So they might be working with other organizations in that same community training them on how to engage volunteers, maybe making volunteer experiences more uh, equitable or then um, also disaster response work as well. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pause for, for the next question. That's great, Brent. Thank you so much. And so there's a couple of things I just want to pick up and kind of um, summarize or tease out a little bit more before we move on to the next question that I heard from all of you. So I think one, Brent, New York comments um, just now in regards to volunteer generation fund, and it actually was on the slide um, that people may not have seen, but you know, one of the other things I think is important to know about state service commissions is that although AmeriCorps is the primary role for all state service commissions, most commissions take on other responsibilities within their state. So many are really focused on volunteer engagement activities as well. And so the volunteer generation fund that's available, those are federal funds, is a way that many commissions fund that work. So that's really, really important. We also see commissions are involved in disaster response and recovery efforts. So I think often the way that a new community might learn about AmeriCorps and other national service is that they have a disaster happens unfortunately in their backyard and national service resources are coming in and really helping in those response and recovery efforts as well so that's an area that we see a lot of commissions involved in um, too and then another one also is like mentoring or kind of nonprofit capacity building so again each commission is a little bit different in kind of its roles and how it looks at its responsibilities but the basic idea is that they really are well positioned in order to really bring all these resources together and help local communities figure out how best to, to use all these different options in order to really address the community need there um, i think another thing that i heard from all of you too is this idea of a commission playing a convening role right so we definitely are looking at the sense of, you know, how can a commission bring together local organizations, how they can bring together state organizations, how they can bring together partners and such, and have those conversations as well. So I think we'll continue to see that theme of the convening role of a commission um, through our comments today, but I definitely wanted to highlight those um, as well based on your initial answers there for the first question. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. Um, so Joy, I want to go to you actually. Um, so 
We've heard over the last two days about how the team from Flint, you know, has really advanced this initiative, um, but really want to dive a little bit deeper about how the commission has Im been involved in supporting them. And certainly welcome to you talk about that when you were kind of on the receiving end of that, certainly when you were at the local level, but also to kind of how you see that support um, being provided now that you're at the state commission as well. Yeah. Um, well, I think we are always looking for an opportunity to plug the awesome things that Flint is doing with the accelerator and this place-based model in general. So anytime we're seeking funding um, around issues related to uh, maybe diversity, equity, and inclusion, or these place-based models, we're always kind of highlighting the great work there. I can't unfortunately take credit for um, the formation or like having a lot of support and input in Flint developing this model. But I can say that from being there, um, the ecosystem of support that the commission generates across the state really creates an opportunity for these kinds of like creative and innovative solutions to be thought up. The commission tries very hard to make some of the administrative things that programs have to focus on very easy and straightforward so they can just kind of check that box off and then really start to think about what are we make what impacts are we making how are we moving the needle on this um, and how do we make that sustainable so i think really our role as the commission is making sure that the whole um, space is held for that creativity and that innovation and that when that happens and there's these really cool ideas like this we create a space for that to be shared both across our state and across the country that's great thanks Troy. Um, so Jacqueline, I want to kind of turn to you now, um, and you you mentioned this in kind of your opening remarks as well, but certainly in Texas, we know that you have two impact communities um, that have been involved with, with the work with service here and such, and, and again, are kind of bringing together um, folks locally to think about how they can be working together and seeing some efficiency in, in doing so. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about the partnership between the commission and, as well as those impact communities in the state and, and kind of how you've been moving that work forward and um, together. Yeah, absolutely. I think the way Joy framed at the beginning of, um, well, we can't take credit for a lot of the work that our programs are leading, creating that ecosystem um, is a big piece of it. So I'm often, uh, whenever I talk about the, what our impact communities are, are accomplishing, I want to be clear that like, they're doing so much of this work, they deserve the credit. Um, but we do try to be supportive and cheerleaders and plug in and, and help um, make sure that we're, we're being a um, a help in progressing that work and, and not a barrier to any of that work. Um, so with it, for a couple examples here, the North Texas National Service Alliance out of uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, they we've done a few things to kind of help them move along with some of their work. Several years ago, uh, we had some unexpended funds in our portfolio. So ad additional grant funds that we don't have every year. Um, so we found ways to invest that with them. We gave them additional funding to do a recruitment campaign. So they had billboards and, and bus uh, advertisements. Um, so some opportunities like that where they're, they're working on this kind of uh, building uh, awareness in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and trying to give them what they needed at that point was funds. You know, different kind of initiatives need different things at different points at that time. They just needed some, some money to get it off the ground. And so we were able to invest in that. Um, we've always, for several years now, we've uh, provided, again, kind of direct funding to support their life after AmeriCorps training and, and these collaborative trainings and events that they hold in that region. Um, so that's one example, one impact community. The other one that we have is AmeriCorps Central Texas or ACT um, coming out of Austin here. And they're doing so many fantastic things. It's hard to keep up with how much um, they're accomplishing. Uh, but a couple examples of ways we've supported um, their work is they had an opportunity um, last year, I'm losing track of my years. This was last year for this current program year that's just ending, um, to raise the uh, living allowance for returning members. And they came to us and they said, hey, we have this pot of money for um, for increasing the living allowance. We, it's probably not enough to cover all returning members in the Austin area. Can you help us think through ways of how to do this equitably and allowably with funds? And so um, in kind of partnership talk with them, found the opportunity to essentially match those funds that they had gotten from private private philanthropy with some of our federal funds to increase awards for some of our some of our grants so that they were able to make that living allowance increase for all returning members in the Austin area um, to kind of pilot that initiative. So 
That's one example. We are very excited that we just submitted a grant application last week for the Schultz Foundation National Service Challenge Grant. Um, and we did that in partnership with AmeriCorps Central Texas. Um, very close partnership with them. They have funding from the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation to advance their work, um, which is, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at place-based recruitment, advancing diversity, equity, inclusion. We were able to, you know, if this grant goes through, we would have the opportunity to replicate a lot of what they've been doing in the Austin area to other parts of the state. And so that's one of the really innovative or exciting things I think happening right now is that we're seeing a lot of these initiatives coming out of one particular place. And now there's these opportunities after it's been a few years of really testing a model, finding out what works, to replicate that and scale that um, in, in other parts of the state or the country. So really excited about that opportunity coming up. Um, the other piece I'll, I'll talk about too, uh, kind of as you were mentioning earlier, Kyra, about other roles that one that commissions play. Um, so one of the kind of focus areas of One Star in addition to AmeriCorps is building nonprofit capacity um, in Texas. And we do also kind of mentioned in my earlier intro is that we have an AmeriCorps VISTA project. And so this is one of these um, opportunities that really does sort of cross multiple program areas. Our VISTA project, all of our VISTAs for those on the, um, in the audience right now that are less familiar with it, they're all doing indirect service building capacity of the organization that they're serving with. And so we have 36 VISTA members throughout Texas that are building capacity of the nonprofits that they're placed with. And so it is advancing that focus area um, for one star of nonprofit capacity building, as well as developing this sort of pipeline of AmeriCorps, um, Ameri organizations that are exposed to AmeriCorps, right? And so we've had a lot of success in seeing um, organizations that have hosted a VISTA for a few years, move on to become AmeriCorps state grants and kind of get their feet wet with what it means to be a VISTA or have, have a VISTA member with them and grow, grow up in that way. So that's that's exciting. And we've seen just in the last couple of months, some really exciting things coming out with um, private philanthropy for our VISTA project. So we're seeing a lot of energy around investing and growing national service right now, which is super exciting. We've had a lot of conversations with different funders about trying to scale national service resources to rural parts of the state, which are admittedly underrepresented in our portfolio of AmeriCorps programs right now. And so we're looking at VISTA, trying to place VISTAs in more rural communities in Texas to build up those resources um, to leverage additional AmeriCorps resources down the line. So various things happening right now. Great. Yeah, no, that's great, Jacqueline. And I, um, you know, I love that you shared the VISTA example. And I think that that really builds on what Brent was talking about as well as kind of using volunteer generation fund, as well as um, kind of the relationship with the United Way Network in South Carolina that really trying to help introduce people right to the concept of national service and, and figuring out what is the right national service resource for them to start. And then knowing down the road that perhaps a larger AmeriCorps grant is in their future, or maybe not, right? But that kind of starting with that, and I think that's an important role that commissions can play and do play around the country is that they're really helping local organizations figure out how do you access these resources in a way that makes sense for your organization based on where your organization is at this at this point in time, right? Where you might be five years from now, what your capacity might look like may be different, right? But let's start where you are. Let's figure out how to get that national service resource, an AmeriCorps member, a VISTA, whatever that looks like with your, your, your organization now so that you can grow with it as well. So um, thank you for everyone talking about those examples. I think that's really, really important. Um, so, Brent, I want to turn to you now um, to talk a little bit more about the um, model in South Carolina. So, in your opening remarks, you did kind of allude to that South Carolina is unique in that um, it really it is the only state service commission that is also acting as an impact community for your state. So, if you could talk a little bit more about kind of how that came about and really what does that look like for you right now? Um, and how is that really helping to build capacity and interest in national service within South Carolina? Sure. So, yeah, I believe our state service commission uh, decided to pursue becoming an impact community about maybe a little over two years now. Um, so um, we, it really came out of the idea that we in order to create the greatest amount of impact for the communities that we serve across South Carolina, we really needed to go past just being a administrator of federal funds. We needed to do some specific work to identify innovative ideas that are happening around the country 
and try to replicate those in South Carolina to both support the work that's currently being done with the AmeriCorps participants that are currently serving with our programs, but also ways to expand the number of opportunities that are available um, really across the state and specifically to rural communities like Jacqueline was speaking about. So really what has come of us joining the Service Year Alliance's impact communities is really it's an opportunity um, to learn from others and uh, receive feedback on our own ideas. And really what it's it's been, it's been like a think tank and also has allowed us to like expedite processes because rather than invent something brand new here in South Carolina, oftentimes other communities across the country have been doing work that's either similar or the exact same thing we wanna accomplish. So we've been able to do one-on-one um, -on -one guidance with um, uh, specific impact communities and receive their feedback so that we can uh, kind of move along projects that we have ideas with. We've also done specific consulting work with other um, impact communities. So like we were able to actually leverage the skill sets to um, move forward with things like engaging rural communities or um, uh, engaging more uh, young men of color in the service opportunities that we have throughout the state. So that's also been a great advantage. Uh, we've also engaged uh, the community in offering trainings to both our commission and our programs and grantees as well. And that's been a great way of like getting kind of the ideas out of just like kind of our staff head and really starting to highlight examples across the country to get our programs and our partners really moving on that. So just like Jacqueline mentioned, we were, we're a big fan of AmeriCorps Central Texas. They presented to our programs a few months ago, and it really kind of started the conversation about how we can collaborate better amongst our programs at the state level, at the regional level, and, you know, not stealing ideas, but replicating those good ones. So it's really been great for us. And again, like, I think it's just, you know, it's advanced things that we can do and make it much quicker than what we could have been doing, you know, kind of siloed on our own. Thanks for that, Brett. And I, I think there's no shame in stealing good ideas, right? I mean, I think that helps all of us advance this work, right? And so learning from one another and being able to have that, those conversations, I think, are critically important. Um, so we are going to continue to ask questions um, of our panel, but also want to really encourage folks to um, submit your questions via the chat box as well. And Jacqueline, I don't know if you saw the great shout out from Natalie regarding the work of One Star in Texas. So that's great. But really want to encourage folks to um, provide um, your questions as well, because we definitely want to address those. Um, so we've been talking about all the really positive things, right, about commissions and how you're working with local communities on place-based strategies and how you're making these investments and you're developing these partnerships and how philanthropy is coming to you and wanted to develop partnerships as well. Um, and that's all great. Um, but we recognize, right, that, that it, not everything is perfect. We don't have a golden path forward on everything. Um, so I just want to dig in and, and give a dose of reality to everybody, right? Like this work is not easy, right? It's it's intensive work. It's time consuming. Um, it can't you can hit some barriers along the way. It's worth it on the other side when you get there, right? But certainly there's this idea that it's not just going to happen like that type of thing. So can you? Um, I want to ask each of you to to share from your um, perspective, like what has been a big like a big challenge or a roadblock that you have faced in your state related to this work? Um, and then kind of, if, if you've been able to move through it, share how that's happened, or maybe if you're seeing a path forward or where you might be stuck to, I think that's fine. Again, I think, you know, we wanna be sharing the reality of what it is um, to do this work. Um, so I'll open it up. I don't know if, if any of you wanna jump into that question to start. Anyone? I can jump in. <laughs> right, Jacqueline, jump in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this has come up in different ways, um, phrased in different ways and somewhat a positive way, but the challenge is always capacity, right? I think that is um, in probably any creative, innovative thing that needs to be or could be done is always capacity to do it. Um, Brent mentioned just a little bit ago that, you know, South Carolina trying to move past um, just being an administrator of grant funds, which is inspiring and I think what uh, you know, we'd all like to get to, uh, but the reality of, but our funding is for us to administer grant funds. So how can we layer in all of the new things that we want to do if that is not where that baseline funding is for? Um, so capacity is a big piece and capacity on two sides, capacity for the commission, right? Um, having kind of carved out staff time, if not a full position, at least that it's on the responsibilities list for someone at the commission to be thinking about these opportunities um, is a big piece, but then also capacity for the AmeriCorps programs that are that are operating too. I think any one of our programs that has participated in either an impact community or any type of kind of lower left regional collaboration of any kind has seen a lot of benefit from it. 
but getting that buy-in at the front end of this is another thing to add to your list. It's worth it and might make your life easier if you kind of work through some of this, but it is an, an extra thing um, is, is probably one of the biggest barriers or challenges that we've seen in kind of going deeper on some of the regional collaboration in other parts of the state, uh, making sure that there's really that that level of, of buy-in and, and expertise. I think when we look at AmeriCorps Central Texas, we are fortunate that a lot of the executive directors and program directors in that area are longstanding directors. So they have a lot of experience and really can see kind of the long-term vision and mission of what this could be. Same for North Texas National Service Alliance. That is that is somewhat true in other parts of the state, but not always. And so having fresh perspectives is always great, but having that kind of longevity and, and understanding of the long game of all of it is also kind of critical to, to move things forward sometimes. Yeah, I'll add the elephant in the room, I think is COVID-19 is the barrier that every industry is facing right now. And even on, on the heels of it, we're looking at the onset of new variants, at public health's ability to vaccinate enough of the population, changes in policy consistently kind of shifting over time. So I think we are um, seeing that it's impacted philanthropy in a lot of ways. Our programs have had challenges in securing their match this year. Um, and where it didn't impact like the coffers of philanthropy, it's impacted their their focus and their and their mission and and where those dollars are going. in this time demonstrate the value of AmeriCorps in a new and very strategic way um, to, to the philanthropic community and to our stakeholders more broadly um, in community. Just to say, you know, don't forget about AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps is definitely a roadway out of the effects of COVID-19. And so uh, really thinking about how can we best demonstrate that. And I think we could do that in several different ways. Um, but I think bringing all of the stakeholders to the table in, in the way that Flint really has um, is very valuable. And I think it gives an opportunity to really get down in the weeds, like for those stakeholders to really get out there and see what's happening, boots on the ground. I, and when I was in Flint, there were many times when funders and uh, community partners were out like boarding up houses with us and like getting dirty. So I think that's always awesome. And then they really get the anecdotal evidence, which I think is all, all, also sometimes more powerful than the data um, to tell a story. So definitely looking at resolving the effects of COVID-19 on our programs. Yeah, and Joy, I mean, I think that that is, it definitely is the elephant in the room in many respects, right? And I think one that certainly, I know all commissions have been facing over the course of the past. I mean, everyone that's on, part of this convening today, right? Like we've all faced it in our own way, certainly. But I think that certainly the role that commissions have tried to play with programs over the past year to figure out how do you switch service activities? How do you think through like what makes sense? Does it make sense for a program to be operating in those same sites? What is, you know, all of those questions that you all are involved in, I think are really, really critical. Um, to us moving forward through this and certainly have been a challenge for everyone. So I appreciate you really bringing that up as well. Um, so Brent, what about in South Carolina? What kinds of challenges have you all faced and how have you kind of moved through those? Sure. So I kind of want to build it, build upon some of Jacqueline's comments around capacity as well, because that's a, a similar challenge that we have here in South Carolina. Then I want to talk a little bit about recruitment and retention of the AmeriCorps members. So we have the exact same challenges as J Jacqueline mentioned. And some of the things that our commission is doing to help address those is we're really priding ourselves on the level of training and technical assistance we're, we're providing. So each year we've kind of been building upon this where uh, with our grant competition um, in the last few years, we've been doing um, uh, concept papers first. So we are narrowing the applicant pool to, pool to the ones that would maybe have the most success with operating an AmeriCorps program. And then we really kind of embed them with some of our staff that actually help guide them through all those different I's that need to be dotted and T's that need to be crossed as far as the application process. And then once again, once they're funded, we actually embed staff with their organization that helps train them on all the AmeriCorps stuff, but actually help them facilitate some of that onboarding work as well. Uh, you know, once a new program director comes on, all of a sudden they have to learn everything about the organization, everything about AmeriCorps. People are telling them, you're supposed to have recruited 10 people three months ago, you know, all this stress. 
So we're finding that like our staff can really help with things like putting together like um, timekeeping policies, those kind of things that our staff does on a daily basis that can really be helpful of organizations that are brand new to the whole AmeriCorps world. Um, going back to VGF, another way that we use those subgrants is um, kind of similar to what Jacqueline mentioned with the VISTA project as a stepping stone tool for organizations that can grow into AmeriCorps programs. Uh, so we've actually shown success with that. We've had two um, uh, volunteer generation grantees that have worked with us for about two years now that have become familiar with like kind of the reimbursement process and kind of like the, the recruitment of volunteers that are very applicable to AmeriCorps positions. And now they are um, in our kind of pool of AmeriCorps programs that we're hoping to launch by in 2022. So it's been a great way of kind of identifying ways to help organizations grow and kind of build that capacity we need. Finally, what we want to strive towards doing is continuing to kind of lessen the burden of that application process. So we really want to kind of blow that up this year and see, we're really inspired by some workshops that ASK has led about, you know, are we looking at the right risk factors or those things that we've just kind of made up along the way type of thing? And just making sure that it's a, a most, the most humane document that it can be for potential applicants that are out there. So shifting gears to recruitment and retention, that's also a challenge across the board for us, um, specifically with offering opportunities for individuals from low-income communities. So one of the biggest challenges has been the low living allowance rate. And that's been something that we've talked about for years, uh, but there hasn't been a lot of work around trying to resolve that. So really as part of our work with impact communities, uh, we identified an organization up in Minnesota that was doing great work, uh, Service uh, Leaders Rising, that was actually offering additional um, stipend or fellowship amounts above uh, the living allowance to offer more opportunity for individuals from low-income communities. So again, we, we didn't steal that, but we replicated that in South Carolina, but we also build upon that. We also decided that one of the biggest ways that we were losing AmeriCorps members were when emergency expenses came up. So things like, um, you know, their car breaks down, they can no longer make it a service, or we've had medical bills come in and things like that. So we're also able to partner with our um, nonprofit association of South Carolina to offer an emergency support fund uh, that gets small amounts of money to help people kind of get over those roadblocks. And that has actually, we've only done it for one year now, but that's lead to a 100% retention among the recipients of that. So we're really kind of excited about that project. Um, finally, again, with our work with the impact communities that kind of been sidelined since COVID was work around engaging more schools, um, uh, national service, I forgot the name of it, but matching institutions that match the education award of our AmeriCorps alumni. Um, as part of like scholarship type of funds to attend their universities and colleges after service. Uh, so we started making some headway on that. It kind of had to um, pause for a little bit during COVID, but we're hoping to get back into that. And then also explain the network of employers of national service to again, allow more opportunities for our alumni after, our, after they graduate to kind of get their foot in the door with potential employers. Yeah, and, and Brent, thank you for that. And you were speaking specifically about Schools for National Service, which is a, a higher ed initiative to basically encourage institutions of higher education around the country to do such things as match the education award that members earn. It might also be to give preferred admission to individuals who have served in AmeriCorps. Um, and we actually have a few states, and this is actually highlighted in um, the the guide that we were talking about earlier, we actually have some states where if you do a year of service in that state, you actually get in-state tuition in that state. Now we've got three states that do that, Arizona, Maryland, and just recently Nebraska as well. So I think again, some creative things that can happen out there when commissions are helping develop these partnerships. Um, and I think the other thing too, that I appreciated that you all talked about it, it's kind of, um, some of these things, they're not insurmountable, right? But it's really kind of, it's its digging in deep with folks on these, trying to figure out the path forward. And I think you really spoke to the role that state service commissions play in really trying to be that um, thought partner, that broker relationship, really trying to kind of also source solutions from other communities and states too, to really help those in your, um, your particular states find a, a path forward as well. Um, okay, so um, we do have a few minutes left. So again, I just want to remind folks that if you do have questions for us, to please put those in the chat box. We would love to hear those. Um, so I want to move on to another question in the meantime. Um, so I think many of you have um, kind of referred to the um, increasing interest 
um, from funders and really coming together with for to advance this work. So certainly we know that AmeriCorps is a federal program. Um, you know, most of the funding to support AmeriCorps across the country is coming from the federal government. Um, and again, we're seeing those funds increase on an annual basis, which is super exciting. And we're, we're hoping for more in the future. But there is this match requirement, right, that programs um, must um, undertake. And, you know, um, but a lot, a lot of philanthropy has been stepping forward and saying, hey, we really see the power of national service. We want to be part of that. So I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about your commission's experience um, in developing those public-private partnerships with philanthropy and what's been particularly helpful for you in being successful with that. Jacqueline, you uh, mentioned the great um, investment from the Schultz Family Foundation for their National Service Challenge for commissions. Um, and we're really excited about that. And so thank you, Schultz Family Foundation, for that investment. Um, but again, what are, what are, what's what been helpful for all of you when you've been having conversations with funders um, to really figure out how to work collectively to advance the work. I'll go first because I probably have the least to say on this one. So um, our commission actually just recently got permission to do fundraising. So we're like super excited about that, but we've kind of hit the ground running um, and we've had some productive conversations with uh, mostly community foundations in the state. And what we're really starting to realize is that you know, we're stronger together than apart. So as a state commission, we have access to some of those competitions like at the federal or state levels that might not be open to uh, community foundations or other local philanthropy. Um, so using us as a commission to kind of leverage those dollars um, with some private funds actually brings in more resources to the state as a whole, which not only benefits the communities that that community foundation uh, supports, but just South Carolina, again, as a whole. So we're really seeing that that resonates with you know both our strategic initiatives and then also uh, the goals of the community foundations um, with those opportunities to kind of refer back to what i was talking about with the recruitment initiatives we're taking and then also the emergency support funds by creating those like funds and uh, those are specific things that we can start investing in and speaking about with funders as well um, it usually also aligns very, very perfectly with some of their same initiatives to kind of expand opportunities uh, for low income communities or with uh, young men of color or, um, you know, also recruiting from like the communities that are, are being served by their organization. So those are also just ways that we're finding that we all align and we wish we could have been working on this for for years, but we're, we're happy to get started. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with that, Brett, you're also talking about, again, as we talked about at the onset, like the grant making role, right? The commissions, ultimately, you all are grant makers, right? But being able to kind of pool the federal resources that are available to you, along with potentially state resource and other philanthropic resources together helps make everyone's grant making, I think, potentially more impactful as well. So, Joy or Jacqueline, anything else that you would want to add to that as well, your experiences? I will share that one of the things we tend to do when we're in need of a new funding relationship is go directly to uh, the locality in our program and say, who are your partners? Who provides your match? Uh, and that's really helped us touch base with the organizations that really know what AmeriCorps is about, already know the impact we're making and are putting their money where their mouth is related to that. And then subsequently to be able to tap into their network of other funders, because this is this is their arena and what they do. So we tend to um, start with our programs kind of network and then build out from there, trying to gain support for whatever cause uh, we're working on at the moment. Oh, you're muted, Kyra. See, I never mute myself for that purpose. Um, so I'm just going to say, um, Joy, um, you know, thank you for that, because I think you're right. Like if a, if a funder is already funding this work, that means they have understanding of it and there's an opportunity to kind of leverage that further. So Jacqueline, thoughts from Texas. Yeah. So once there has kind of an interesting relationship with private philanthropy, I think, and I, interesting because we have been a funder outside of AmeriCorps funds at different points. So um, our full name, our legal name is One Star Foundation, which is how you see us represented in some places. And we've recently through our strategic planning sort of dropped foundation because we felt like it was a little bit of a misnomer and people would come to us and think we had unrestricted funds that we could just grant out. And that wasn't really the, that's not the case, um, but it is in certain situations. So after Hurricane Harvey, we partnered with the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation and raised a hundred million dollars for uh, for relief from Hurricane Harvey and had a grant making private grant making competition for that. So we have that type of role that we play. 
But in terms of our AmeriCorps space, that was really kind of two separate um, entities. So within AmeriCorps space, it's relatively new for us that we're talking with private philanthropy about expanding national service throughout the state or working with local programs. Um, and so part of this is we're going through a feasibility study right now on our fundraising. So Brent, kind of similar of you guys just got, we all got approval for it. We're kind of assessing what could this look like for us on our, our end. Um, so it's, it's newer in that way. Um, I think some things that we've done kind of regardless of us directly going for private philanthropy is supporting our program so that they are well positioned to go after their own private philanthropy. So we've had several or uh, programs that are from smaller organizations in our portfolio tell us that, you know, without this sort of stamp of approval of I've managed federal funds and I've done it compliantly and successfully, they wouldn't have had a chance at going after state funds or a certain private grant or something like that. So working with them to kind of build up that credibility. Um, we are always um, always open to providing a letter of support when, it, when one of our programs is writing a grant application to a private um, private funder. So that's, I, I think, probably the largest role that we've played up until, honestly, like three months ago. I feel like three months ago, a switch happened and like suddenly all these conversations and partnership opportunities are are happening right now, which is great, um, but, but relatively new for us. Um, the last thing I'll actually say is that uh, as we talk about private public partnerships, I think we have really seen our role up until recently of that public partnership piece of it. And so we've supported, we've been creative in kind of how we can use our federal money in some ways. And so I think for a commission that is a, a tool that we have in our toolbox of um, we can kind of get, we can offer planning grants to programs to do certain things. We can increase a grant award for a specific initiative. We can do some things like that. So um, while they may be trying to go after that private philanthropy, we're, we're kind of using the, the utmost flexibility we can with the public funds that we manage. Great. Well, thanks to all of you for sharing that, because I think that's just helpful for perspective for folks to kind of better understand like how those pieces are fitting together. So we're almost at time. Um, so I want to make sure that we wrap up our um, time together today um, on time as much as possible. So one last question for the panelists. Um, so and I ask you to do this concisely if you can. Um, what's the one piece of advice you would give to other state service commissions that are trying to support community collaboratives or place based work in their respective states? So one concise piece of advice. Just one is going to be tricky, but if I had to say one, I would say listen rather than prescribe. Maybe the flip model in its exact iteration is the right fit for your community, but it's most likely that it's probably not. So think about what are your program's capacity, your member's capacity, what's the capacity of your service recipients? And then, you know, what do they need? What do they value? And how can you fill their, the, the gaps with this, with this strategy? So just thinking um, to hear before we come up with these solutions. I also think it's challenging to just keep it to one, but I guess the one that I think I would like to share is just kind of investing in your staff time's ability to really just get out to the community and attend like meetings of interest or conferences or training events. Because first of all, that has a plus for your staff because that helps them kind of grow and also keeps their interest level alive. But then we show that like just the relationships that are built for just getting out in the community, they pay dividends down the long run. So you might not access someone that you, you met like two years ago until all of a sudden the perfect opportunity comes up. So we've had a lot of success with just like allocating within staff time to let them kind of get out into the field and meet people post COVID. Uh, I was going to say something similar to Joy, so I'm going to twist it a little bit and say lean into your convening role um, and bringing the people to the table and then do what Joy said of listen, right? So get get the right people kind of in the conversation and then hear what the need is and what, what the opportunities are from there. Right. Well, thank you to you all. So again, um, join me, everyone that's participated today and thanking our three panelists, Joy, Jacqueline, and Brent. Really, really appreciate you providing the perspective from your particular commissions. And I think there's a lot of valuable conversation here as well. And again, really excited to, you know, to see how program development and these types of initiatives really are advancing um, in your particular states as well. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and end our time today, um, but thank you again for participating in this session.